You didn't want to talk about the drugs, did you? No, that's... Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't say that's a huge factor. Am I looking to the camera for the intro? Yeah. Okay. It does make sense, doesn't don't, it? Don't tilt your head back. I was... <laughs> <laughs> hey, guys. Uh... <laughs> Lean forward and... <laughs> White screen. What? Um, where was I? I've completely lost my chain of thought You're now. introducing the podcast. There we go. Thank you so much, AJ. Welcome. <clears throat> Pop a warning sign at the bottom. <laughs> hey, guys. Chris from Beyond the Boards and also Hockey Tutorial here, back with the third episode of the podcast. In this episode, we've got a couple of interesting topics to go over but the first one i wanted to start on i'm definitely going to say this this might get a bit dark but we'll see how it goes the first uh topic i wanted to start on which i think any hockey player can relate to is uh, i guess some of the highlights of the best elements of playing hockey and maybe even touching on a little bit about what the people in your lives have had to do or go through for you to be able to be doing what you're doing um i think some of the best things about hockey is it's definitely when when you're winning that's that's when the team's like at the at the peak. Like you're all winning, you're all happy. Team team couldn't be any closer. Like when, especially when I was in juniors, I went from two years at Guildford League winners, didn't lose a game, and then went to Chelmsford and done the same thing. And the team is just they're like a family when you're like that. When you're winning, everything's all good. You're like a family. You know? Nothing nothing's gonna get in the way of that, especially when you're winning. And uh, sacrifice is dead. My family have definitely sacrificed a lot. From from when I started, the amount of travelling and money that has gone into my hockey, my whole family sacrificed. That's that's a dead certain. With especially my dad driving all over the country, taking me to rinks, trials, and all that. We would definitely wouldn't be where I am now without without all that sacrifices for sure. Oh, that's sweet. And Gary's in the background just on his phone. Nice oh, wow. Well. Yeah, you don't care. You don't care. <laughs> Gary's a legend. You don't care. What about yourself, JJ? What about yourself? Yeah, probably similar to Tommy. Um, you know, from from starting as young as I did. I mean, my dad played for the Raiders, so I was kind of at Romford I think, from a few days old. Um, as soon as I was able to put a pair of skates on, I think I learned how to skate before I learned how to walk, just being around the place so much it was you know you see something done so much you kind of you know you want to have a go and it kind of really uh, tumbled from there really once I got on the ice it took me a couple of days of just standing there not knowing what to do once you learn how to skate it was literally next thing in your hands a stick and kind of followed suit from there really um, yeah as with Tommy started playing at Romford when I was a kid went all the way through the junior set up from well, back then what would have been you know the the beginners program, the, the under 10s program, followed up through 12s, 14s, 16s, um, won nationals at 12s, 14s and 16s every other year. Uh, I won it with the under 14s as an underage as well. So quite, you know, good memorable things to to make note of. Um, I think once I got to like kind of top end 16s, the, the management side of things at the rink changed a bit and a lot of the kind of the, I wouldn't say elite, but the kind of the, the top end players look to, you know, go to other clubs. A lot of people, I think Tommy went to Chelsea with a few, uh, you know, the other guys. Uh, I went over and played at Bracknell for, for two years just because it was, I say, as, as local as can be. It was, a, you know, we, me and my dad knew quite a lot of the coaches there through, you know, the conference set up, the, the junior uh, England and, and, and youth programs there. So it was just a, a very, a very nice club to go to. It essentially, there was more. Is it fair to say that there's a bit more opportunity for you to go there? Oh, big time! I, I played my first couple of games as a as a senior there, as a, a 16, 17 year old kid. Mm. So I played for their what would have been the the inner one team, which is like kind of I don't know what they what league that would be now, but it was kind of like a second string. So it was just under the the old EPL. Um, and for people there. that are listening, they don't know what the EPL league is. The EPL was what well, is what the National League is now technically. Um, it was the old English Premier Ice Hockey League, so it would have been teams. Like the old Raiders, uh, Telford, Sheffield, Swindon, Peterborough, the teams that are in the National League now with the Raiders. So, um, yeah, so that that was that. Um, I took a, a bit of a a break after that. Oh, sorry, no, I, I went back to Romford, played the second from last year at the old rink before that we got knocked down. Um, I then was very fortunate enough to take an opportunity overseas. I went and played in America for a year, playing a, a junior A over in Dallas, and it was... Uh, 
fantastic experience. I was, you know, anyone who ever asked me about it that, you know, he's younger than myself and asked how it was, it probably kind of put me on the spectrum of professionalism as to where I am now as a hockey player, just because of, you know, the, the people you're around, you're on the ice every day, you're in the gym every day, you know, you, your life pretty much is hockey. Besides doing the odd bit of, I wouldn't say sightseeing, but doing the odd bit that the locals do, that was pretty much about it. My life was hockey for, for nine months. Um, and then I came back, played two seasons in the old EPL with Bracknell and Basingstoke, and then came back to Romford the two years before the, the new rings opened, and it's kind of where I'm at now. So, What would you say is the, if you had to think of like some of the biggest sacrifices that your family, friends, close relatives have had to kind of make to allow you to do what you do, what would you say would be the one that sticks out the most? Probably the same as Tommy. It's the same you know, for, for everyone that's in both of that or that has been in both of our positions as a hockey player or as a sportsman, I think hockey's a little bit more of a uh, of a challenge to, you know, fully commit to, like Tommy said, but the travelling. Yeah, there's very few sports that I think will have you doing trips around the country and around the around Europe as, as frequently when you also factor in the cost of the equipment, etc. Yeah, of course. I mean, me and, me and Tom have both been very fortunate where we've been able to play for well, junior national teams since the age of, what, 12, 13? Yeah. You know, nowhere else where, well, not that I know of playing football or any of my friends at school, where they have to say, oh, you know, I played for, you know, my national team at under 13s, under 14s. I got to go to Quebec. I got to go to Latvia. Cool. I got to go to, you know, parts of Europe that, you know, <laughs> most kids, I say, wouldn't dream or even wouldn't think about going to, but. It gives you the opportunity. You know, for Tommy and myself, they're, they're, they're hockey countries. You know, if you want to be the best, you've got to go and play in the best, best countries and the best places in the world. So. I think from, once again, both of our perspective, you go and play against these kids that are on the ice five, six times a week. You know, we were, well, unless you trained up when you were at Romford, you are probably only on the ice an hour, two hours a week, maybe a game every other weekend. Yeah, big big difference. Oh, big time. And this is, that that completely well, off topic replicates where these nations are in, you know, double HF world rankings. You know, GBR up there, they went up a place last week. But, you know, when you put us in the category of Sweden, Finland, Canada. Yeah, they, they run the, their entire programs completely differently. Like we did a video that kind of touched base on how hockey is run. We did like a, an episode of our annual series, which is Hockey In, where we go to a different country and tell the story of how hockey works there, whether it's a, a, a country that's completely off the grid, like the Himalayas in India, mm-hmm. or if it's a country that like Sweden that is known for being good at hockey and we discuss what are they doing? What are their secrets and why are they so successful? You learn that the way that they run the game, the way that they run their systems, their training academies, the the junior, the, the junior programs, it's completely different to the way the rest of the world does it. And I think there's a lot, not that I'm speaking from a lot of experience having, you know, not really gone through the, the systems in the UK myself, but from what I can see from the outside, there's a lot that we could learn from the way that countries like specifically, not even Canada and the US, specifically Sweden, the way they do things, being a small country, you know, they're not as big as, as Canada or the USA, but they've got a really, really nice system that is clearly putting up results. If you look at how, look at the size of the country and then look at how many Swedish NHL players and you know, players that play in leagues that have a similar standard or a similar skill set mm-hmm. that they have. It's it's unreal. And it's it's definitely worth maybe looking into and seeing what we could pick up from them to make our systems over here better. But moving from that, what I wanted to ask you was, Tommy touched on essentially what the best part of this whole hockey thing is. For you, if it's from a team perspective or a personal perspective, what would you say is the best part about being able to do what you do? Probably the, you know, the social side um, you know, obviously at school, you know, you, you have friends that you see every day and, you know, when you leave, it's, it's either going to be one of those, you keep in touch with them or you don't. Mm-hmm. I speak to probably four or five people I went to school with, apart from the occasional ones that I might bump into in and around town, just from where I still live local to, to where I went to school. Um, obviously with there now being a new ice rink in a gym, I see a few people I used to go to school with, but... Apart from that, I wouldn't say there's more than yeah a handful of people I talk to on a regular basis or a daily basis. Ninety to ninety nine percent of my my friends list on on my phone or or anything are, are people, people through hockey. Yeah, you know exactly. Just because what you mean. it's it is a lifestyle, and you know I, it's it's another great aspect that I don't think comes with any other sports. You know, if you I think, think I think it's the, the the locker room because oh yeah, massive. I mean, if you look at like football for the American or anyone else that calls it soccer, I'm talking about soccer, but you can football get for us, in two minutes exactly. It's it's you, you're whatever they're called, the studs or trainers, whatever the hell they put on their feet, and then shorts, t-shirt out. 
That's but it. hockey, it's a process. Like guys show up like an hour, two hours before they're on the ice. Oh yeah. Well, you know, on a Tuesday and Thursday, I'll be at the rink at half seven. We go on the ice at half nine. Yeah. You know, you're there. It's. I think that's what creates the bonds. Yeah, definitely. And you know, like you said, like Tommy said, it's it's, it's part of a family year in year out. Whether you get a couple of new guys each season, or you know, you stick with a, a core group of guys you played with for you know four or five years. You get guys that've been on the same team. You know, it's, it, it is a family. You know, you've got your outside life and you've got your hockey life. If you're fortunate enough that I am at the moment and have been in the past, where you're able to you kind of mix those together and you know socialize outside of hockey, it's it's a completely different different experience. You know, like you said, for people that play football, you turn up on a Sunday, it's raining, you get changed in the car, you get on the pitch, you play 40, 50 minutes, you get subbed off, and that's that's pretty much it. You don't get to experience the social side of it. Not as much hockey, anyways, yeah, for you, sure. You're there an hour before a game minimum. And, you know, you're in there talking about, you know, video games, NHL games that you've seen. It's just the, the lifestyle as a whole is just second to none. And no, it's I an agree. experience now at 26 years old, playing hockey for 20 odd years, I, I wouldn't change. Absolutely not. From there, for you, Tommy, this is probably where things will get a bit, get a little bit dark. <laughs> what would you say is the dark side? And I, I mean specifically the things that, you know, people from the stands or, you know, the bleachers or whatever the hell you want to call them, people that are watching the game from the outside yeah. don't get to see. Through the juniors, it's, 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 it's not so bad. The juniors is all right. Obviously, you have the... The, the favourites in teams and stuff like that. But when you get to seniors, there's sort of two roads that you can take. You can either take the road of, yeah, I'll have a drink after training, I'll have a drink after games. And that's, that. in my eyes, that's that's the wrong direction. Because, yeah, you're one of the boys, but it's not really a good path to go down. Really, you want to go down the path of, no, I'm going to earn your respect by what I do on the ice. And with that, there's a lot of peer pressure in that as well. And you've got to be able to say no to go down the right road. What kind of things have you had to say no to? Uh, like like after games, after training, all, all, us, all the senior players, go on, have a beer, have a beer, be one of the boys, have a beer. What's, what's the point? All, all for a drink, a bit of a laugh. You can have a laugh without a beer. Take the right route and earn their respect on what you do on the ice and how much work you put in. And I know, I, I know a few players have gone down the wrong route. And where it's got them, I know it isn't where they want it to be. So just being able to say no to that peer pressure is probably the hardest thing that's I've faced so far. It's because you've got all the players in that change room. Here, have a beer, take a beer, go on, have a beer. And just to be able to say no is is probably one of the hardest things I've had to face at the minute. From the perspective of the people in the locker room, obviously you being, if everyone is doing the same thing and you're the only one sat there saying, I know what I want to do, I know where I'm trying to get to and this isn't the way that I want to do it. So no, how how does that how is that taken by the team? How does that make you look? Uh, you have you have some players in there that are like oh, I just don't want, don't want to drink, you know. And then you have the I'd say the more professional ones that sort of understand the like, you know, he's, he's making a good decision here. Where you've got some of them in there, they're just like nah, it's you have a pansy in here. Don't want to have a drink. Whereas more professional players sort of take it like a. I respect that he's doing the right thing there. In your experience, without getting into too much detail, what would you say is the worst thing you've had to walk away from? And this isn't necessarily a reflection of the people you're playing with now, or it might it might even be somebody that you know that is playing in the same level as you or playing somewhere else in the country. Like, What would you say is, is some of the things that people don't know about that's going on inside the locker rooms? It's it's definitely the fact that some some of the senior players just hand beer to un, underage players. Yeah, players that are like sixteen, seventeen. They're like, yeah, go and have a beer, down it, be one of the boys. And I've I've had to sit there and watch players my age just down beer, and because I won't do it, it's sort of like so some of them are sort of like, no, nah, he's not one of the boys, is he? But why don't you don't want to do it? Because it's just it's something I've never really done. I've never really drunk. I've always every team I've been in, I've I've worked to get there, and I'm not going to throw it away just because I want to have a beer or have a drink after the game. I'd rather, I'd rather you know just have a water or like a glass of coke with the boys. Or like Lucas Aid because I never see you put those things down. <laughs> Best drinks, man. Come on, <laughs> not sponsored. Do you know what I mean? Like I'd rather I'd rather earn their respect through working hard and what I do on the ice. Yeah. Rather than being a clown and getting with them through Dan and beers in the changing room. 
Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. I make him right. I think from if I was to look at it from my side of things, obviously there's a an almost kind of ten year age gap between myself and Tommy. I first played for Raiders when I was Tommy's age, sixteen, seventeen, and mm-hmm. you know the, the game has changed so much, and I I would probably class myself as maybe one of the last years or the last kind of people that wouldn't so much have called it abuse or anything along those lines, bullying, whatever people would call it now, but the you know. The way that you're portrayed as a 16, 17 year old on a team, you're you know you're playing on a team with men. You need to be the rookie. You do certain things, and that side of things has has completely changed. And I'd probably say has changed for the better. But no, like Tommy said, there are certain situations where you know you're 16, 17, you're playing on a team with men. You know you get man and match beers after the game. It's just what happens in this country. And I think it happens pretty much in any of them. Well, yeah, exactly. Now, and I think <laughs> there's a like Tommy said, there's a level of, of, of what you're willing to do to fit in or what you're willing to do on the professional level. Like he said, there's guys in the changing room that I've played on and still do now that will be like, no, nope, you know, I, I don't drink during the season. I won't have a beer unless it's, you know, after we've won a cup or something, which, you know, people will look at it and go, oh, cool, I'll take that approach next week. And, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it's don't. Unfortunately, alcohol and the, the, the motto of, you know, just having a beer or having a, a casual drink and that's where it can go one way or another. So I, I respect people. I respect Tommy for not having a drink when he, you know, when he doesn't want to. He's 16, 17 now if he wants to have a drink and he, if he wants to have one, perfect. If he doesn't, it's not a big deal. It's not, you know, you shouldn't be looked upon differently for not wanting to yeah. follow suit, you know. I I know for where if I ever get man and match hand out of beer, he won't take one. I know there's guys on the team that won't take one, guys that will take two. It doesn't make me view... Tommy any different from not taking one to the guy that takes two or the guys that will take one home with him is you just kind of deal with it. People are completely different on and off the ice. As long as you can turn up week in, week out and do what you need to do on the ice to win us a game, I'm not too bothered about what you do off the ice. That's fair. I think that's that's an interesting approach and it's something that, that will kind of like lead onto a different tangent because um being able to show up to your job, in this case it being hockey, mm-hmm. and perform to the standard that's expected of you. To some degree, I think that's kind of where it stops. But obviously, because of the world that we live in, because of social media, because people are able to keep an eye on what you do away, yes. you have to be cautious and you have to kind of portray this image of somebody that's not going to step a foot wrong, regardless of where you are. Oh, of course, It not. comes down to, it's a really messed up example, but it comes down to like the controversies that was going on with Tiger Woods. For me, it's like, yeah, okay, it, it, maybe he's not the greatest person, or maybe he's made mistakes that aren't really a good reflection of, of good character and, you know, people that... Uh, the good character of somebody that people should be looking up to wanting to be able to replicate. But at the same time, he's a human. And if he's able to go away, do whatever he does as messed up as it is, but still show up and do what he's supposed to do. I think obviously you need to address the issues that he has in his life. But at the same time, why don't we just concentrate on the fact that he's still doing what he's getting paid to do? If he's still able to to uphold the standard that's expected of him, that's cool. And then the crap that he does on the side, it's like, yeah, that's not great. That needs to be addressed, but it doesn't need to be the main reason that, you know, he's being flagged or he's being booted off of a team, et cetera, Mm -hmm. et cetera. I think the world of social media has made it so much harder for players in general across any sport to be able to kind of be themselves a little bit, you know. Social media makes life difficult. Oh, of course, of course. It's, it makes everything, it it puts you under the microscope. Even more. 99.9% of the time, as opposed to only being under, under that kind of scrutiny when you're at the rink, Mm -hmm. you know, speaking to interviewers or interacting with fans it's now like that regardless of where you are what you're doing and that obviously means that we're going to see a lot more things happening that are going to be i guess deemed as upsetting to some people but it's like where do you draw the line big time you didn't want to talk about the drugs did you no that's yeah i wouldn't say that's a huge factor it's not no it's it's the same in any any sport or any walk of life you know you always no matter where you live in the country or in the world i, I don't think a drug uh, like drugs and all that is a massive part within hockey i think it's more like jay said the alcohol after the games that yeah. is the big factor like obviously you do unless have... it's beer league because then that's just a different story well exactly but once again you you know you, you're still playing a sport and it's not it's there not is... a good idea no, well no yes and no but it's the same as yeah exactly so you've got to you have to be a, a certain level of professional 99.9% of the time. The amount of times I know, myself included, that you know, you've know you had to refrain from tweeting something or responding to something on Twitter because you know, once again, it's another avenue, but it, you know you have to deal with it. If you're in a position of you know the, the media attention, whether that be however big or small, 
you've got to be prepared to, you know, be able to maybe bite your tongue a little bit. Is that why your Twitter's private? Yes and no. I've had a, unfortunately, a couple of instances. I was a lot younger. I was probably 16, 17, responded to something on, on Twitter and it, it come and, come and bit me, uh, bit me in the behind literally two days later because fan sees it, gets screenshotted, which you can do and have been able to do for a while now, mm-hmm. get sent to the right people and, and that's pretty much it. And yeah, that was about eight years ago and you since then I've, nope, that's it. I've had my share of that. I mean, obviously posting videos on YouTube, you can imagine. Of oh, course, cool. you, you can get backlash off of anything, no matter get. how good or bad. Yeah, it's, it's. I think one of the, the lessons, um, I know he's probably going to be listening to this podcast, Lee, who's kind of like, I've mentioned this in lots of videos before, he's my mentor. He's one of the guys that's kind of helped me be able to turn making videos on the internet about ice hockey into a a career. Mm -hmm. And one of the things he was taught me was if you're going to post something, the first thing you have to ask yourself is how do you benefit from that? And how do the people that are reading it benefit from that? And if no one does, what's the bloody point of sharing it? Yeah. And the amount of times that I've had to kind of reel myself in and be like, "Mm, yeah, I could say something really smart and cheeky, but I'm not. Because instead of reacting aggressively now, if I get a comment that's bad, I'll react sarcastically. With humor or positivity. Yeah, like I'm, I'm never going to be rude. I'm never going to swear. Um, I'm never going to say anything that's, that's horrible. I'm just going to be sarcastic as hell. And it's, it makes me laugh. And what I found is that in the comment section, what you have is other people that watch the videos, people that love what we do. They'll jump into the comments and they'll hammer the person for me, mm-hmm. which is great. So it's just about being able to pull yourself back and just not act too impulsively about a decision that, you know, about a situation that's, that's unfolded right now. It's, you know, even walking away, cooling down for a second and then rethinking what you do. Cause there's times everyone can say it where you've reacted impulsively to a situation and you look back an hour later and you're like, man, I wish yeah, I that was, that. that was not a great decision. So. Exactly. Exactly. But you were going to say something just before Jay jumped in. What were you going to say, Tommy? Do you remember? Well, I said, it's just the alcohol side. That's probably the biggest, the biggest decision within hockey. As soon as you turn to a senior and the alcohol comes into the game, it's, it's, it's that decision of whether you want to take that road or that road. That's probably one of the hardest decisions you need to make as a senior player is whether you're going to have a drink and all that as a young player or as whether you're going to go the way of well, this, this is kind of going to suck, but it's going to be harder, but it will pay off in the long run. Yeah. I think playing playing things from a long run, like a, a long run perspective rather than, you know, rewards right now is, is, the way that a lot of people need to be thinking. It's not how you can be rewarded right this second. It's how this can be consistent and continue for a long duration of time. But people want things done. I mean, I'm, I'm the worst saying that because I'm impulsive as hell. But <laughs> it's it's something that, that I've I've had to kind of like try and, and be better at. But yeah, for, for sure. I think that's definitely the way that you want to take it. That, that topic there, you could talk about it. There's there's so many avenues you could, avenues, sorry, you could go with it. Like, like we discussed the social media side of things. I think uh, another big tip, uh, big thing, sorry, certainly, you know, kind of where I grew up and obviously Tommy not being too far, you know, the people you mix with at school, like I said, you either carry on talking to them or, you know, you, you distance yourself and you have other friends in other, you know, areas or whatnot. But, you know, 90% of the people that I knew at school are, you know, and this is no reflection on any anyone or anything that they're doing in their life at the moment. But if you were to ask them, 10, 10 years before, you know, what do you see your life like in 10 years? Guarantee probably 80, 90% of them would be like, oh, you know, I wish I had, or I, I want to be doing this. And for some reason, something that's come in the way and, you know, kind of put a halt on that, hasn't completely ruined it because, you know, that until you take your last breath, you you know, your life's still yours. You can change things. You can do things differently. But you could get mixed up with people that, you know, want to sit and drink in a park at two o'clock in the morning on a Friday night. You know, for people like me and Tommy, two o'clock on a Friday night, we were probably on our way back from, Haringey or Sheffield for a you know a conference or an England training. It's how you, it's the avenue that you want your life to go. Yeah. And as I said, the, the people that it's not just the people inside an ice rink that influence you. Nine times out of ten, the people outside of the rink can either influence you to go one way or the other. You you know you sit and get involved in that the dark and dangerous route of drugs, alcohol, and, and whatnot, or you use that as a you know don't really want to do that. I'm going to go down this route, like Tommy said. So. I think a, a big part of that is that kind of like leads on to quite nicely into a, a slightly separate topic, but it's about the, the, the groups that you keep around you. Oh, of course. Like I'm a massive, massive believer of like the, the whole subject of energy. When you're around people that are creative, that are inspiring, that are driven, dedicated, consistent, it's very difficult to be in a group of people like that and not try and emulate that yourself. And it can be spun. If you're that type of person, motivated, creative, you can be consistent, but you're hanging around with the wrong types of people, 
if the energy around you is negative and it's only going to be steering you down, how can you expect any other result other than the one that is the most logical one, which is you going downhill? Mm -hmm. Surrounding yourself with the right types of people is super important. It even impacts my life from a creative perspective, like Ricky behind the camera now. He's a creator himself. And if it was just somebody that held a camera that filmed with us, it would be much harder to be able to come up with ideas to keep things consistent. Like we're running two separate podcasts, one for electric skateboards, one for hockey, two separate YouTube channels, mm -hmm. in, like in tandem, like we're, we're managing to drop content on both of them consistently. And if I didn't have somebody else that was creative around me, it would make it difficult for me to be able to still stay on that, on that mindset. Of course. If I was surrounded by people that just wanted to mess around and, you know, drink and do whatever that it's very, very easy to kind of like fall into that circle of, of, you know, recklessness. And it's, I think that's probably one of the, the, the big takeaways from this is to watch the people that you're spending your time with. Because I think one of the funniest quotes that I ever got back in the day was, show me your friends and I'll show you your future, which is as real as it gets. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if, if you, can, you can see the path that people are going to go down, like you were saying, based on their actions and based on the people that they choose to try and impress to want to be around. So it's just about making the, the right decision to want to stand on your own two feet. It doesn't matter what people view you as for making the decisions that you're making. If you believe that they're going to benefit your life, why the hell not? Makes uh, sense. I think, it's, I think it's more of like, especially within hockey, it's how much you want it. Yes. If, if you want it bad enough, you'll be able to sit back and go like, I'm, I'm okay. I'm all right. I'll wait. You're so, not missing on anything because exactly. it's like, this, is, this isn't what I'm trying to get to. Yeah, this isn't like the, this, the peak. Like this, this is just me getting started. I've still yeah. got a long way to go. Yeah. So it's, it's all how much you want it and how bad you want to get where you want to go. That's, that's, that will decide what path you go down, especially within hockey. So like I said, hockey is a lifestyle. You either choose to you know, fully commit to it, put your all into it from the moment you start, or you don't. Nine times out of ten, or I say nine times out of ten, probably ten times out of ten, people that turn up half-hearted do it because you know they're averagely good or or whatnot, or you know it's, it's time for, it's, it's something for them to do. Don't take it serious, and you know once they stop playing eighteens or once they stop playing juniors, that's that's it. They you know they they don't carry on. Whereas the people like Tommy said that you know wake up every morning, you know know that they want to do something to get better at a uh, sport to. Uh, you know, five, ten years down the line, still play and still be competitive at, right? they're the people that will play. They're the people that will carry on doing it. So I think motivation's a big thing, whether that be self-motivation or other people around you being, you know, your motivator. Parents, family, friends, teammates can all be that. But you're the person who wakes up and gets yourself out of bed in the morning. I'm a big believer in motivation. I I love a motivational quote. I always write them on the board in the room if, you know, we've had a bad weekend or something like that. And Nine times out of ten is for my own benefit, but if I know that that's being seen and somebody else reads what I've written and that's helped me, you know, it, it might help other people to, you know, just kind of grit a little bit harder or, you know, put an extra minute or two into something. You turn it left or right on an idea of, am I going to do it? Am I going to not? You taking another maybe minute or so to read something that might push you in the right direction. It's, it's a benefit for me. For sure. And if I was to ask... What you do, I'll start with you, Tommy. What do you do to stay motivated and to stay like consistent, to wake up and still want to train, still want to practice the good habits that's going to help your essential end goal? I'd say it's definitely how, how, much, how much I've put in so far and all the rubbish that has come through with going down that right path of, I don't want to drink, I'm going to work hard, I'm going to get their respect on the ice. And... How, how much love you have for the sport. I mean, like, if, if, if you go to the ring, you're like, uh, training again, you're not going not gonna to be that motivated. Like, I've definitely been in teams where you're like, God, it's, it's training today. Whereas you want to be in teams, you're like, it's, it's training, let's go, let's get there an hour early, let's go to the gym. Like Jay said, he, I've seen him at the gym, because uh, obviously I work at the ring. I've seen Jay turn up, like, two hours before, he'd go down to the gym, I've seen him do that when we're filming. It's, like I'll get there and you're getting down from the gym and then you're stepping on the ice to go training. I'm like, what? It's, it's the definitely hell? it's the love you have for the sport and how good you want to be at it. Yeah. How much benefit you want to be to your team and and stuff like that. That's what will motivate you. Like, like I said to you before we started filming, it's it's staying motivated during this whole lockdown situation to be able to get up and go. Yeah, I'm gonna work out today. I'm gonna, I'm gonna train again. I'm gonna do something to benefit myself be able to be better for when I go back that's that's probably a big thing right now 
for for every hockey player. Yeah. To be able to get up and go, I don't know when I'm going back, but I'm going to train anyway. Just just so I'm ready. It's it's a massive thing because if 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 you're not motivated, you're not you're not going to train. You're not going to get out of bed. You'll sit there and play PlayStation or watch YouTube instead of getting up, working out, benefiting yourself. It's it's definitely a big thing. What about yourself, JJ? What are you doing to stay motivated? Pretty much kind of spot on. Um, like I said a minute ago, I'm a I'm a big kind of motivational speech or motivational quote person. Are you one of those Gary? What's his name? Gary V. Gary V. Yeah, he's a he's a bit of an inspiration. There's a, there's a few guys out there. Um, <sighs> FYI, mine's Wolf of Wall Street. Well, exactly. And as bad as that story is, and you know, you look at how he was able to, you know, build the company he did right or wrong obviously took the wrong path doing so but uh, yeah he, I, I i do have to clarify i mean his work ethic. yeah we're, 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 yeah we're not promoting anything <laughs> what he's done but the, the, you know Amazing the work movie, ethic though. behind some people and the well like you said gary v the guys if anyone that hasn't followed him go and look on any of his social media pages he, he posts videos of lectures talks and stuff that he gives and the amount of people that will go up after and thank him for half hour of his time that has completely kind of changed their mind on a topic or, you know, kind of changed their, the route that they were going to go with a career option or, you know, a, a business venture, an idea, you know, he's, he's probably one of the best up there with, uh, well, another great favorite of mine, Tony Robbins. I, uh, I had a couple of jobs working in the city that were kind of sales related. And it's a, I think that's kind of where playing sport and being in that, that, that career at that time has pretty much kind of, you know, helped me to be where I am today. I love a motivational video. Anyone that follows any of my social medias, you'll you'll see them all over the place. Nine times out of ten, I'll I'll have them on while I'm running or while I'm at the gym because you hearing something that is pushing you further than where you thought you might have been able to go. I think that kind of you've just kind of like sparked another idea in my head, which is the content. <laughs> just that started a wildfire over here. Honestly, yeah, like the content that people consume online. This is another big one, right? And. I am a massive, this is another reason why I wanted to start a podcast. I love podcasts and I'm going to get ridiculed for this. I don't mind saying it. I'm a huge Logan Paul podcast fan. He's podcast impulsive. Let me, let me preface this by saying I, I knew of him on YouTube for all of the wrong reasons. And I never, As ever everyone bothered knows with his content. for the wrong reasons, never bothered with his content. But then there's another group of it. Like funny enough on YouTube, I watch nothing hockey related at all. At all. That surprises me. Honestly, nothing hockey related. I watch, um, a lot of motivational stuff, um, a lot of kind of uh, creative stuff, a lot of tech stuff, because that's kind of like where I'm at. If I, mm-hmm. I do hockey all day for work, last thing I want to do go is go home watch more hockey and, and consume do more, more hockey. hockey. It's like, yeah. I, I don't need to do that. But I watch a, a, a group of guys called Yes Theory and their whole kind of preface, the whole thing that they do with their channel is to seek discomfort. So something that if you're like really scared of doing public speaking, they'll get someone and they'll like create like this whole elaborate thing, get them to tackle their fear of, of speaking publicly. It's It's great what they do. And they were on the podcast, the Slogan Paul's podcast, Impulsive. So I was like, if they're on it, it can't be that bad. So I was like, I'm going to watch it because I like to watch everything that they do. And I freaking love the podcast. And I've been watching loads of them ever since then. He's had everyone from porn stars to billionaires to multimillionaires to social media influencers. Like the catalog of guests that he has is incredible. That escalated. I know, right? <laughs> but, but the point I'm trying to make with this is that... um because that's the type of content that I like to consume when you're hearing a billionaire, for example, break down their elements or their recipe to success. You know, the whole consistency thing. It's, it's the main thing that people lack. A lot of people have good ideas. A lot of people are able to start their ideas. Many kind of are scared of failure, so they don't want to do it. But the ones that start, a lot of the times the reason that they go wrong is because they just lack consistency. So when you start to watch content, that helps you to understand, you know, the, the elements that are needed to be successful, not just financially, not, you know, in sports. I mean, just generally be successful, whatever mm-hmm. that, you know, translates to in your own life. You it, you can't expect to be filling your time watching rubbish. It's like the notion of how the internet is used today is one of the things that, that pisses me off the most. You have devices like these that have limitless knowledge. If I wanted to become, I don't know, a doctor, I could use this device here for free yeah, and learn probably somewhere within the, the region of 60, 70% of the things that I need to be able to pursue that career. Yet people use it to share videos of people doing dances on TikTok. Yeah. It's like, so that, that it's, it, I don't understand that mindset, but just trying to surround yourself both with the people that you hang about with and also the, the stuff that you consume. If it's, it doesn't have to be boring. If it's, if you like, I love, you said you like your um, motivational speeches yeah, and stuff like that. Time. I like movies that kind of have the same effect. 
like um, the social network, for example. Oh, I watched like, that the other day. Quite, I knew the story. Yeah. Obviously, everyone knows the story. Well, hopefully, everyone knows the story. If you haven't watched it, go and watch it. Amazing movie. It's a good watch. The you know the whole idea of literally it just being you know go go about a, a bit to drink after a breakup with a girlfriend started you know one thing online and Led to next thing and an idea turns into a you know a multi-billion pound kind of company that everybody that i know yep. uses today so the youngest billionaire in the world but aside from that because obviously this isn't something that's like financially driven because obviously success to different people means different things but the the whole point of this is that if you're able to consume media like that so you're you're constantly learning and constantly being kind of like informed about how to be better at what you're doing. It's I think that's the kind of best place to be at, especially if you're in a position where you lack motivation because of what's going on in the world right now. If I watch something like that, if I watch a podcast with a guy that's been able to build this incredible empire or get him, himself to like people that live off the grid, for example, that literally have no financial commitments, they live in a van, they get to like drive around the world, they're surfing, they're relaxing with their family and their partners, like that kind of stuff to me is like, whether it's that spectrum or the guy in the mansion with the Lamborghini, whichever one is your happiness and your happy place, to be able to get there, like I want to try and do everything I can to make sure that I can get to my happy place. But And when I watch these types of content, I sit there and I get up and I'm like, what the hell have I done today? Like, yeah, what have I done today no, exactly. that's worth anything? And that makes me want to get up and like put it in, into sixth gear. And that's the point that I was trying to make. It's like, you have to be conscious about what you're consuming because it, it plays such a massive part on how your brain interprets the world, how you interpret things around you, the, you know, like your motivational levels, your consistency levels. If you're watching rubbish, how can you expect to be anything other than what you're consuming? It's like what you eat, right? That's exactly it. It's, it's the same kind of fact as that. And it's, it's how I try and... and kind of like live my life but there's a bit of a bit of a mouthful but that's it's that's my two cents kind of spot on i mean this like you said with the, oh, the last couple of chats we've had about being locked down what are people doing whether that be hockey wise or life wise you know if we, what we've been in lockdown for six weeks as of what tomorrow i think it's you know for, for anyone that's listening you look back from six weeks ago what have you done in that time you know, have you been somebody who's fortunate enough to still be working so you've been fairly occupied? Or have you, you know, picked up a new talent, done something new? Have you learned something new? Have you kind of got fitter, you know, eating better? Anything along those lines. It hasn't got to be kind of sports specific, but obviously for Tommy and myself, it yeah. 90% is. So but, what have you done to benefit your life? Well, yeah, exactly it. Um, as I said earlier, I, you know, our, our summer's been a little bit more extended with the coronavirus situation. So, you know, most hockey players around the world have had a bit more of a, a break or a bit more of a, a, a kind of training schedule. So, yeah, what, what have you done in the last six weeks? How are you better than what you was yesterday? Yeah, no, for sure. I think the the start of lockdown kind of was like a nice big holiday for everyone. And then I think most people, I know I did, I went through a period of just like... The effects wore off very quickly. It was, it was like holiday and then, I'm not going to lie, I went from holiday to debauchery. And yeah. then from debauchery, then it started to go, okay, we need to be productive now. And then from that moment of like, oh, let's get productive with this, like the amount of stuff that we've done, like the amount of content that we filmed, the stuff that we've got planned, it's all been set in motion because I've been like, we can't do anything other than create content either from the confounds of this office or what we have like outside where it's, you know, safe and I guess smart to be able to be around to do, so, yeah. to do stuff. But no, yeah, it's, I, I definitely agree. It's like, what, what have you done to, to benefit yourself or to benefit those around you? A good chat. It was a good chat, wasn't it? Should we close it? Can do. Do you want to go... Well, there's so, there's so much to talk about. There's, I there's... can do. Oh, we've not gone through any of the points I had. So I wanted to go through the world of custom. I wanted to go through the skates with graphics. I wanted to go through skate protectors. And I wanted to go through the most pointless product. We can save that for another one. Or we could just carry on and you can make two. No, it wouldn't work. We'd have to intro it again. Damn it. What do you think, Ricky and Gary? Should we, should we cut it there or should we keep going and move on to some other topics? Yeah, I think this one's... If you want to keep it, it's a good and bad. Serious. Yeah. yeah so well, no, that's what I meant. Is like if you stopped about, it now yeah. and then reintroduced a new one, we could talk about all the points you've got on your list there. That's another half hour and another episode. Okay, fine. All right. So hopefully you guys have in... What's going on? Are you on me, Ricky? Are you on me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Um, so hopefully, guys, that's kind of shared a little bit of insight into the way we think, the way that we analyze things, what keeps us motivated during this time. And some of the things that hockey players, I guess a lot of hockey players can relate to some of the things that you guys have had to go through and some of the things you've had to overcome and ignore to stay yeah. focused, to stay on the right path. Hopefully it's been educational, maybe entertaining for yourselves. As always, guys, make sure you thumbs up the video, subscribe, subscribe to the channel and also the podcasting space as well. 
Um, if you want to, you threw me off with that. You said something about listen. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to make sure that you said about and listening to the podcast. Okay, right? yeah, cool. Because you cool. just exited as like a video. So yeah, like, yeah, like got you. Listening. Right. As always, guys, thank you. As always, guys, thank you very much for watching the podcast all the way to the end. Hopefully you've been able to take away something from this, whether it's kind of like the way that we think, the way that we live our lives, what helps us stay consistent, or if it's just taking note of some of the things that these hockey players have been through and hockey players, I'm sure, around the world can relate to what you guys have had to endure, ignore, and try to stay on the right path for the greater good of what you guys are trying to accomplish. But um, yeah, as always, guys, make sure that you thumbs up the video. If you're watching the video on YouTube, subscribe to the channel. And if you're listening to the podcast, make sure that you're rating, subscribe in the podcast so you can help us move up in the rankings. But as always, thank you very much. And we'll catch you in the next one. You guys want to sign out? Cheers, guys. Thanks for watching. Cheers, guys. Thanks for watching. One point I'll add on the end of Chris, no matter what me and Tommy spoke about, you know, if you always got nice people around you, you're never alone. You can always talk to people, no matter who it is. Take care till next time, guys. Peace.